Section 9 of Days with Great Poets. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Libby Gone. Days with Great Poets by May Clarissa Gillington Byron. Chapter 9 A Day with William Shakespeare. It was early on a bright June morning of the year 1599. The household of Christopher Montjoy, the wig-maker, at the corner of Silver Street and Cripplegate, was already up and astir. Mountjoy, his wife and daughter, and his apprentice, Stephen Bellet, were each refreshing themselves with a hasty mouthful, one could not term it breakfast, before beginning their day's work. For town wig-makers were busy folk, then as now. Every fashionable dame wore transformations, and some noble ladies, like the late Queen of Scots, and, breathe it low, the great Elizabeth herself, changed the colour of their tresses every day. Breakfast in 1599 was a rite more honoured in the breach than in the observance. Most people, having supped with exceeding heartiness the previous night, ignored breakfast altogether, especially as dinner would occur some time between ten and twelve a.m. Those who could not go long without food had no idea of a regular sit-down meal during that precious morning hour which has a piece of gold in its mouth. They contented themselves with beaten up eggs in muscadel wine, as now the Mountjoy family, who, being of French origin, boggled somewhat at the only alternative, a very English one, stale ale and bread and butter. To these good folk, standing up and swallowing their morning draught, entered their well-to-do lodger, Mr. William Shakespeare, up betimes like them, for he was a very busy person, and shared their jug of eggs and muscadel. Mr. Shakespeare was thirty-five years of age, a handsome, well-shaped man, in the words of his friend Aubrey, his eyes light hazel, his hair and beard auburn. He still retained in some degree the complexion which accompanies auburn hair, and this imparted a tinge of delicacy to his sensitive and mobile face. He was already slightly inclined to en bon point, for the seventeenth-century people aged soon, and thirty-five was much more like forty-five nowadays. In all company, with all people, Shakespeare was charmingly pleasant-spoken. He had long since shed any provincial gaucherie, and was of exquisite courtesy, of a very ready and pleasant smooth wit, again, to quote his intimates, a good-natured man, of a great sweetness in his bearing, and a most agreeable company. Moreover, that indefinable ease of bearing, which accrues with success, was evident in the gracious bonhomie of his mien. For after many years of stress and struggle, many hard bouts with fortune, innumerable humiliations, and adverse events, he was now prosperous, popular, possessed of this world's goods. Although a self-made man in every sense of the word, although still a member of that despised theatrical profession against which the pulpit thundered, at which the decent citizen looked askance, he was a distinctly marked personality, not to be ignored. He was part proprietor of the Globe Theatre, the Blackfriars, and the Rose, and he had house property in Southwark and Blackfriars, lands and houses at Stratford-upon-Avon. He had obtained a coat of arms for his family from the College of Heralds, thus constituting himself legally a gentleman. He was a brilliant author of immensely popular plays, and he was reputed to earn at the rate of six thousand pounds per annum, which would now be worth nearly eighty times as much. Such was the man who presently sauntered out into the summer sunlight this June morning, and went leisurely westward towards Holborn. He strolled along, thoughtfully ruminating the day's work before him, but, but courteously alert to every greeting from passing acquaintances in the streets. He encountered as he went warm and invigorating scents which floated round each corner, and rose for the nonce above the malodors of the open gutter. Pleasant midsummer perfumes which were exhaled in the clear and smokeless air of those days from a multiplicity of blossoming London gardens, for every house had its ornaments of potter's ware or metal. The floors were still strewn with leaves and grasses, and the doorways often decked with boughs. Cherries and strawberries were ripening in the ancient monastery gardens, among the majestic precincts of ruined priories. Blackbirds were singing in the trees. If the actual dewy freshness of the Warwickshire water meadows were not present in the London air, if the wild roses of the Avonside did not bloom in Holborn, yet Shakespeare had only to close his eyes one moment to project himself back into his boyhood scenes. For London was emphatically a garden city, encircled by forests and fields and farms and wooded hills, and the ecstatic sweetness of an English June was wafted over its cobbled thoroughfares. Of all seasons, this was the most enjoyable to Shakespeare, because of his passion for flowers. 
He delighted to make long, luscious lists of flowers. Their very names were a pleasure to him, each fraught with its own special significance. He loved to write of daffodils, that came before the swallow dares, and take the winds of March with beauty, violets dim, but sweeter than the lids of Juno's eyes, or Cytheria's breath, pale primroses, the crown imperial, lilies of all kinds, the flower de luce being one. To collect, in imagination, roses, their sharp spines being gone, not royal in their scent alone, but in their hue, maiden pinks of odour faint, dainty smellless yet most quaint, and sweet time true. Carnations and streaked gilly flowers, and the lovely company of the garden were a joy to him, and equally so the wild flowers in the woodlands where the wild thyme grows, and oxlips and the nodding violet blows, over which the south wind breathes softly, stealing and giving odour. Beneath the tangled woodbines and musk roses the poet could linger in fantasy, if not in fact, in dream, if not in deed. A passionate enjoyment of wild nature distinguished him preeminently above all his town-bred compeers. Trees and birds and forest brooks, but flowers especially, claimed an equal place with music in his affections. Beauty of sight and sound appealed, with magic power, to the man on whom the robuster joys failed to make any permanent mark. For towards all the salient characteristics of the Elizabethan age, the volcanic vigor, the incandescent longing for adventure, the magnificent daredevilry of seamanship, the fierce and splendid valor, inciting men to desperate deeds. William Shakespeare was strangely impassive and unimpressionable. The wave of Elizabethan ardor surged past, and left him not even sprinkled by its spray. He was quite content to go on clothing with new flesh, glowing and dragony like the antique bones of old romances, to infuse new life into forgotten medieval episodes, crudely treated by his predecessors, the men who supplied stock plays for travelling companies. He preferred some ardent love scene in the rich, dim gardens of Verona to all the opulent possibilities of the new world, some pageantry in Venice or in Athens to any present splendour of the Elizabethan court. He secretly revelled with consciousness and justifiable pride in pouring forth imperial passages of words, reverberant with rolling sound, but frequently, for the sheer pleasure of musical effect as it would seem, he introduced those exquisite lyrics, bird-like in their careless spontaneity, flower-like in their grace and daintiness, which float like flakes of thistledown above his plays. These songs say all that need to be said. They condense into a few swift words the essential spirit of the whole drama. So in Othello, my mother had a maid called Barbara, says Desdemona, standing unwittingly upon the threshold of death. She had a song of Willow, an old thing t'was, but it expressed the future, and she died singing it, that song tonight will not go from my head. The most apparently casual and irrelevant ditties of Shakespeare's dramas, in like manner, express the future of the story. Come unto these yellow sands, and there take hands. So eventually Ferdinand and Miranda avow their mutual love beside the lapping of the long blue waves. Under the greenwood tree, who loves to lie with me? Might be the very light motif of As You Like It. Sigh no more, ladies, ladies sigh no more. Men were deceivers ever, one foot in sea and one on shore, to one thing constant never. Here you have the treachery of Don John and the vacillating mistrust of Claudio succinctly summed up. Journeys end in lovers' meeting, every wise man's son doth know. Thus the clown in Twelfth Night becomes mouthpiece of the denouncement, which was never long in doubt. To every man his métier, and that of William Shakespeare was not to be the mouthpiece of those spacious times tingling with sensation, with excitement, with huge enterprise, exhibiting throughout the curious patient persistence of the essential Midlander, he had worked his way right up from the bottom rung of the ladder. The ill-mated young man of twenty-three who had left Stratford with a travelling company of players in 1587, who had, whether conscious or unconscious of his genius, plotted industrially onwards as a literary hack of drama, tinkering, adapting, reshaping, and rewriting the stale old stock plays, until they suffered a change into something rich and strange, whose colossal greatness his contemporaries were not great enough to appreciate. That same man was now arriving, like so many other Midlanders, at a point where criticism could not touch him. He had gained no giddy pinnacle of success, but a safe and solid summit of assured position. That he should attain it in his own way, and after his own methods, that, after all, was his business. 
There were plenty of other poets to utter arma virumque cano. William Shakespeare preferred to link himself with thoughts of Italy and fairy folk and the sea coast of Bohemia, with youth and palaces and forests and fortunate or frustrate love. His range and scope were enormous if he cared, his output astonishing if he chose. Meanwhile, it was midsummer and there were roses. Moving meditatively along Holborn, he presently encountered his old friend Gerard the botanist, whose herbal had been published two years before, who stood at the head of his profession for knowledge and achievement. He lived in Holborn, where he had not only a fine garden ground, but a fruit ground in Fetter Lane, which he superintended for the surgical society of which he was a member. "'Well met, Will,' said the grave and reverend herbalist. "'No other man in London would I more gladly welcome, for that thou hast the most worthy apprehension of the seemliness of plants and herbs. Country blood, country blood, good sir. Come now into my poor enclosure, and let me regale thee with new and marvellous things. What? It is but eight of the clock. The paltry playhouse shall not claim thee yet a while. We are all Euripides in his dramas, in comparison with that which wherewith I shall rejoice thine eyes. And seizing the poet's hand, Gerard drew him through a side door into his beloved garden. Behold, he exclaimed, the apple of love, pomum areum, and with ineffable pride he pointed out some slowly ripening tomatoes. These grow in Spain, Italy, and such hot countries, from whence myself have received seeds for my garden, where, as thou seest, they do grow and prosper. Howbeit there be other golden apples which the poets do fable growing in the gardens of the daughters of Hesperus. These, he added regretfully, I have not. Master Gerard, there shall no golden apples ever come to England worthy to compare with yours, remarked the dramatist, luxuriously inhaling the warm June scents shut closely within the sun-baked walls, and gazing down the coloured vistas and aisles of bloom. Here's flowers for you, he murmured to himself. Here's a plenty of sweet herbs, hot lavender, mince, savoury, marjoram, the marigold that goes to bed with the sun, and with him rises weeping. These are flowers of middle summer and I think they are given to men of middle age. See thee here again, continued Gerard, well launched upon his favourite topic. This plant, which is called of some Syrix of Peru, is generally called to us potatus, or potatoes, and he waved his hand towards a bed of sweet potatoes. Of these roots may be made conserves, toothsome, holy and dainty, and many comfortable and restorative sweetmeats. Other potatoes there be, which some do use with salt, but of these I have no present apprehension. Shakespeare was not paying attention to the potatoes. On his knees, beside a strawberry bed, he looked up with a laughing face. Methinks I would rather fresh fruit than conserves, he said, filling his mouth with much satisfaction. Then of the Italian pot herb, tobacco, the botanist proceeded. Give me joy that I have had good fortune in three kinds thereof, the henbane of Peru, the Trinidada tobacco, and the pygmy or dwarfish sort. The juice, boiled with sugar into a syrup, is a sovereign cure for many maladies. I pray you, good Master Shakespeare, said he, earnestly seizing the other's arm and punctuating his words with a gentle seesaw movement, believe me that any other herb of hot temperature will suffice for pipe-smoking, rosemary, thyme, winter savoury, sweet marjoram, and such like. Faith, I am no great smoker, replied Shakespeare, as with a dexterous jerk he eluded his friend and dived down an alley of damask roses. Here, said he, I shall play the robber. He gathered a rose and set it behind his ear in the most approved court fashion. I would fain linger all day among these manifold sweetnesses, he added, but alack, I have need to hasten now. I pray you, therefore, give me leave to depart. The herbalist, talking volubly, accompanied him to the door. The playwright turned down towards Blackfriars. On his way, he entered an apothecary shop and, heedless of Master Gerard's warnings, purchased a rich smoke at a at sixpence a pipeful, equivalent, perhaps, to four shillings of our money. This was no cheap and adulterated mixture, such as the groundlings used, but the very best procurable, and to emphasize its recherché quality, it was kept in a lily-pot, minced on a maple-block, served out with silver tongs, and lighted from a little fire of juniper shavings. Shakespeare, having thus filled his long clay pipe, proceeded to the Blackfriars shore, where he took a ferry-boat across to Bankside in Southwark, and entered the Globe Theatre, of which he was part proprietor. It may here be explained that every theatre having recently been banished from the city, as the very quintessence of disreputability, and the root of all evil, 
the exiled players had taken refuge south of the river in Bankside, which, being a quarter singularly ill-famed, was considered by all reputable citizens a most appropriate situation for them. The Globe, like other public playhouses of the period, was roofless, three stories high, with boxes all round in tiers, and the grand tier paled with oaken boards and fenced with strong iron pikes. The stage, which had a shadow or cover over it, was some forty feet wide and extended to the middle of the yard or pit. At the back of the stage there was a balcony, over the entrance from the tiring house or dressing rooms. It was lighted, if necessary, by branched candlesticks, while cressets, tarred ropes ends and cages, were set in front of the boxes. The Globe Company was of about ten actors. Burbage, Hemming, Condell, Fields, and the rest were entering by ones and twos with the boys who played the women's parts. Last of all, the orchestra of ten performers, the largest in London, dawdled in and took up their instruments, chiefly drums and trumpets. The rehearsal commenced, the play of Hamlet with Burbage in the title role. Shakespeare, though necessarily present, paid but little attention to the business in hand. In studied and self-conscious acting he had no interest whatsoever. His theory was the same as Ben Jonson's, that a man should act freely, carelessly, and capriciously, as if one's veins ran with quicksilver, and not utter a phrase but shall come forth from the very brine of conceit and sparkle like salt and fire. But this was too high a criterion to impose upon his company. He therefore left them chiefly to their own devices, under the capable management of Burbage, and remained himself in the tiring room, employed upon his usual morning's avocation, revising and revivifying old stock plays, and considering fresh MSS, which had arrived in vast numbers, and accepting as much as he could. For he was incapable of jealousy, and he did his greatness easily, and was the kindest of friends, the most indulgent of critics, to the would-be dramatic authors. His acquaintance with Ben Jonson had originated in a remarkable piece of humanity and good nature. Jonson, unknown and unaccredited, had offered a play to the theatre, but the persons into whose hands it was put, after turning it carelessly and superficially over, were just upon returning it to him with an ill-natured answer that it would be of no service to their company, when Shakespeare luckily cast his eye upon it, and found something so well in it as to encourage him to read it through, and afterwards to recommend Ben Jonson and his writings to the public. Row. Similar experiences befell many a budding stage-writer, Shakespeare's singular sweetness of disposition led him to be lavish of praise as of money. He was always willing to touch up this man's play or write an act for that one, and of no other man did he utter a cruel or injurious word. A kinder gentleman treads not the earth, his intimates might have said of him, as he of Antonio. Yet it might almost be averred that William Shakespeare found himself a dramatist by accident. He accepted from the first the conditions of a life despised and condemned, the life of an actor classed with rogues and vagabonds, banished with contumely into ignominious neighbourhoods. He looked upon the half-art of acting with disdain and disgust. He saw his worst plays performed much more frequently than his best. By nature, a poet, pure et simple, of a delicate, fastidious, bookish temperament, one who continually corrected his best verses and critical scrupulosity. He had been thrown into the rowdy pothouse company of second-rate actors, and was accused by jealous rivals of being an upstart crow, swelled out with inordinate vanity, or jibed at, by those who professed themselves his friends, and a slovenly and careless writer, or openly condemned by the very lackeys and menials, should he receive a call to court. And this was only one of the darker sides to the life of this gentle-natured, cheerful, seemingly successful man. The others, as we shall presently perceive, were in some sense infinitely more tragic. The rehearsal over, and the hungry actors pouring forth to obtain their dinner at the nearest taverns or cookshops, Shakespeare, who had, as we know, already broken fast, recrossed the river and paced quietly up towards St. Paul's churchyard to visit the bookseller shops. The signs of White Greyhound, The Angel, The Spread Eagle, The Green Dragon, The Flower de Luce, and so on, were the recognized rendezvous for men of letters, and Shakespeare's own earlier works, such as Venus and Adonis, Lucrece, Henry the Sixth, Henry the Fourth, and Richard the Second, were issued at several of these shops. Here he could foregather with learned and literary friends. Here he could sit and study the latest books. Here, in short, he was no longer the actor, 
but the author. And it may be noted in passing that Shakespeare's literary confreres respected him, not as the permanent dramatist of the globe, the transmuter of old lead into gold of Orphir, but as a lyrical poet, an authentic maker of the beautiful verse. The muses would speak Shakespeare's fine-filled phrase if they could speak English, so ran the encomium of his admirers. His sun-guard sonnets, they declared, were of surpassing excellence and charm. His facetious, pleasant, grace in writing, as they turned it, which approves, proves, his art, was that of the sonneteer, not of the playwright. That state and majesty, that knowledge of human nature which distinguished his dramatic work, seemed to his contemporaries quite foreign to the man they knew, the witty, gracious, graceful poet. After a short look-in at his favourite bookshops, Shakespeare proceeded to another popular rendezvous, the middle aisle of St. Paul's. This was no sequestered haunt of studious folks, but a busy promenade, where all sorts and conditions of men met freely, by appointment or otherwise. Here one might encounter the down-at-heeled adventurer, or the masterless man or penniless companion, side by side with a rubicon citizen, the opulent merchant, and the country gentleman whose talk was of hawks and hounds. Every condition of character, every variety of type, was here for Shakespeare's sharp eye to scan. Every fragment of conversation that fell upon his keen ears was noted down almost automatically. Friends and acquaintances many were here to be encountered. The popular writer received salutations on every hand, and those who might benefit by his well-known laxity of purse were not slow to avail themselves of it. Money frequently changed hands before Shakespeare passed out of the cathedral. He had the customary careless generosity of stage folk, and the fact that he was reputed to spend as much as he earned was doubtless largely due to his lavish free-handedness. Nobody could look into that kindly face and expect a no to any asking. But now it was striking twelve on every clock in the city, and he turned into Cheapside, to the Mermaid, which stood between Friday Street and Bread Street. In those days, few except the upper classes dined at home. The restaurant habit of the twentieth century prevailed among middle-class town folk, especially those who were only lodgers or visitors in London. And the cookshops, ordinaries, and taverns laid themselves out to provide such hearty dinners as were necessary to people who had only two meals a day. Upon the table to which Shakespeare sat down there was a stewed rabbit, a roast capon, a salmon stuck with cloves, and a piece of boiled beef, a jug of ale, a flagon of white wine, sack or canary, and a quart of claret. Honey was poured over the meat, and the wine cups were half full of sugar, for the Elizabethans loved sugar and spice and all things nice. Every dish was highly seasoned, highly sweetened, and spiced to what we should call a nauseating point. Cooked vegetables were but little used. These strong meat-eaters disdained them. Potatoes were not yet indispensable articles of diet. Herbs, fruits, and roots, in fact, played a very secondary part in town fare, though poor folk in country places must needs make shift with these. The plates were of bread, the dishes of wood, and the wine was poured into small green clay pots. Shakespeare did not linger over his dinner. Naturally no great eater, and by the robust, full-blooded Elizabethans considered a very poor drinker, he was lost in thought. That customary flow of scintillating wit, which made him the life and centre of a crowd, that nervous, excitable, impatient brilliance which often characterised him in company, seemed a while to have forsaken him. To the irrelevant ups and downs of the artistic temperament he was singularly subject. Various familiar friends passed in and out, with loud and jolly greetings. Mr. Will Shakespeare was hail-fellow well met with all men, from carters to courtiers. But to-day Mr. Will Shakespeare only smiled at them with a humorous pensive air, and yet retired further into himself. What was saddening and silencing him? Had a sudden distaste for his occupation seized upon his sensitive mind? Had some slight been put upon him by careless young nobles, such as my lords Pembroke or Southampton, who take up a man one day and drop him the next? Had he received ill news from Stratford, as when the tidings arrived three years ago of the death of his only little son? Or was he simply cogitating one of his sugared sonnets? Thus the quidnuncs of the mermaid questioned among themselves, and there was much surmising and putting of heads together, and wagering upon the thoughts of Master Shakespeare's melancholy for of a surety he had lost his wonted flow of spirits. 
but only one or two men guessed truly at the secret troubles that sat heavy on his cheerful mercurial mind seventeen years ago at the age of eighteen shakespeare had made a hasty and ill-assorted marriage anne hathaway his senior in years his inferior in position was no fit mate for the impetuous ambitious youth a father at nineteen with neither employment nor source of income he had chased and fretted for five years against the consequences of his own rash folly at twenty-three he found the position intolerable he quitted stratford and had never returned save for brief and flying visits nor had he ever brought up his wife and children to london he was maintaining them in comfort he was purchasing a fine house in stratford whither he would eventually retire and play the parts of husband and father but blame him or not as you will there are limits beyond which human nature cannot be forced and the illiterate ill-tempered incompatible anne hathaway was the skeleton in shakespeare's cupboard not to be explained away the thought of whom left a bitter taste at the bottom of every pleasure so far things were bad enough but there was even worse to follow the lad whose calf love had flung him into ill-considered matrimony was now a mature man and two years ago he discovered for the first time what the love of mature manhood can be like with equal folly equal recklessness to his first affair he had conceived a desperate and hopeless affection for a woman who exactly reversed the previous conditions for she was very much younger than himself better educated and of much superior rank the dark lady of shakespeare's sonnets upon whom he lavished all his golden wealth of phrase laying open the most intimate secrets of human love and scorn and anguish was in all probability mary fitton a girl of nineteen maid of honour to the queen proud high-spirited vivacious unquestionably beautiful although in the old age black was not counted fair aristocratic grand dame to the finger-tips in every respect the antithesis of countrified shrewish repellent anne hathaway yet the dark lady was inherently wanton false and faithless shakespeare recognised this but it made no difference to the strength and intensity of his passion so true a fool is love that in your will though you do anything he thinks no ill in sonnet after sonnet he expressed his despair his patience of contempt or injury no such sounding of the whole dear passion of love no such revealing of a tortured human heart has ever been put before the world not marble nor the gilded monuments of princes shall outlive this powerful rhyme and he depicted various features of this woman in various roles in play after play he could not shut her out whether he pilloried her dark beauty as cressida or cleopatra whether he masked her wit and spirit under the name of beatrice or rosalind whether he alternately implored or inveighed against her in sonnets he was enthralled by so magnetic a fascination that it influenced his art at all points shakespeare the man shakespeare the artist was obsessed by bound fast in a hopeless infatuation for a woman who he knew to be unworthy indeed here was sufficient matter for musing but the poet's unhappy reveries were cut short by the appearance of a young man his brother edmund who had recently arrived in london and obtained a small acting part at the blackfriars theatre he addressed the older man with a mixture of respect and boyish naivete goodwill lend me a groat or so ere i perish of sheer hunger six long hours have i laboured at their plaguy rehearsal and i have not a penny in my pocket in faith i never starved like this at stratford i swear i will repay thee two days hence the elder brother with his easy tolerant air waved the lad to a seat and shouted for the drawer or waiter anon anon sir and the functionary hastened up the mermaid was emptying now and the attendants were less hurried and flurried shakespeare ordered a second dinner for little though he had eaten the food was cold and patting his brother affectionately on the shoulder slipped a handful of money into his hand ay marry thou hast a good warwickshire hunger and thirst ned said he let it not cry out upon thee in vain for me i am away to the globe they play hamlet there to-day and needs must i be present he did not wait for thanks but with his peculiarly pleasant smile slipped out of the mermaid and made haste towards his theatre the globe was already crowded when he arrived although the play did not begin till three there were no evening performances in those days except in noblemen's private theatres burbage the favourite tragedian as hamlet drew a great following but the humble part played by the author himself as rosencrantz was a succes d'estime rather than a genuine one for mr william shakespeare was no very wonderful actor a fellowship in a cry of players held little glamour for him 
The man who could imagine, with every vivid circumstance of detail, the sinister and foreboding atmosphere of Elsinore, had little admiration for the strutting and bellowing of the players who interpreted his visions. On either side of the stage sat the young noblemen, the poetasters, the shorthand writers who worked for private publishers. In the boxes, priced up to half a crown, about one pound of our present money, were various aristocratic and wealthy patrons of the play. The groundlings obtained standing room in the pit for a penny, say six shillings, and were vociferous in their applause of the sanguinary scenes, of the gravediggers, and of the grosser jests. Everyone who could afford it smoked. The classes, rich authentic tobacco, and the masses, men and women alike, an adulterated mixture of coltsfoot and other hot herbs. As for the middle class, the merchant folk, tradesmen, and the bourgeoisie in general, they were chiefly conspicuous by their absence. Strongly pervaded by a growing flavour of Puritanism, and having a wholesome decent horror of play-acting, as something undoubtedly congruous with all dissolute ways and ill-living, the middle classes avoided Bankside like the pestilence. Had they been present, they would have been sorely put to it to understand what in the world Mr. Shakespeare, through the mouth of Hamlet, was jibing at. Was he decrying actors? Was he condemning audiences? Was he scorching with bitter disdain all who wrote for, or acted in, or crowded into playhouses? The young gallants, uncomfortable and uncertain, were glad when the play scene was over, and one arrived at more familiar matters of battle, murder, and sudden death. Too much metaphysics about this Hamlet fellow, so they held. A dramatist should stick to his last, and not drag his heroes into deep waters of conjecture, where a man might well flounder forever. The play was over. Some few adventurous spirits from the audience approached the tire-room door. Hemming held it warily ajar. I would speak with your author. Where is he? I would have a word with Mr. Shakespeare. Is he within? Not this way, I assure you, sir. We are not so officiously befriended by him as to have his presence in the tiring house. To prompt us aloud, stamp at the book-holder, swear for our properties, curse the poor tire-man, rail the music out of time, and sweat for every venial trespass we commit. Was it not Mr. Shakespeare, then, that played the part of Rosencrantz? inquired the bewildered ones. Close the door, thundered Burbage from within, followed a sound of bolts and bars. Meanwhile, Mr. Shakespeare had disappeared from the malodorous precincts of the globe, for the adjacent bear gardens were notorious for evil effluvia, had crossed the river, and was making his way to the mermaid, where he arrived about six. A plentiful supper was already being partaken of. The rooms were full of steam and savoury smells. Supper was a smaller meal than dinner, but in no way stinted. Lettuces and radishes were usually served first, and afterward a variety of highly flavoured dishes. Pigeons stuffed with green gooseberries, fiercely seasoned herring pies, roast pork with green sorrel sauce, mustard, horseradish, ginger, and honey ad lib, and sweet dishes innumerable. Shakespeare did justice to his food, and took copious draughts of light sweet wine. The morning's melancholy had passed away and was succeeded by an almost feverish gaiety. The artificial stimulus of the theatre had produced a temporary excitement in him. He was flushed, brilliant, loquacious. As his repartees flashed rapier-like across the room, Ben Jonson smiled grimly, seated at the head of the table, and a score of kindred souls who surrounded it relished the verve and sparkle of their favourite comrade. Jonson was a man of great size, of immense strength and personal courage, masterful, domineering, jealous. He recognized and allowed the extraordinary genius of Shakespeare, but always with many detractions, insinuating his incorrectness or a careless manner of writing and a want of judgment. That the Stratford shopkeeper's son, utterly unequipped in scholarship or training, should stand so high in popular estimation above himself, the university graduate of great learning, was acutely annoying to Johnson. It may be, too, that with the littleness of certain minds, he had never forgiven Shakespeare for doing him a good turn in the matter of his comedies. At any rate, he resented the Warwickshire man's unparalleled quickness, brightness, and flexibility of tongue, and every evening he inaugurated a duel of words, which almost invariably resulted in a draw, and which was the delight of those privileged to be present. At the Mermaid, says Fuller, one of these favoured auditors, many were the wit combats between Shakespeare and Ben Jonson, which, too, I beheld like a Spanish great galleon and an English man of war. Master Johnson, like the former, was built far higher in learning, solid, but slow in his performance. Shakespeare, like the English man of war, lesser in bulk, but lighter in sailing, could turn with all sides, tack about, 
and take advantage of winds by the quickness of his wit and invention and thus it befell that the frequenters of the mermaids such notabilities as raleigh fletcher marlowe beaumont green were accustomed to hear these two great poets disputing and to join in the tournament in words as beaumont put it so nimble and so full of subtle flame as that if every one from whence they came had meant to put his whole wit in a jest and had resolved to live a fool the rest of his dull life hours passed swiftly away in this congenial manner the amazing fluency and readiness of shakespeare showed no sign of flagging the whimsical delightful happy-go-lucky humour which he has put into the mouths of so many merry folk was still at its most laughter-provoking stage when suddenly by one of his customary revulsions of feeling he was seized by a great distaste for the heated apartment the flaring light the stale odours of wine and ale like cassius he had poor unhappy brains for drinking and the endless potations due at a city tavern were singularly unsuited to his taste he felt that he would give a thousand bursts of mermaid applause for an acre of barren grounds long heath brown firs anything that was out in the clean pure air though he was a thorough townsman outwardly the ineradicable instincts of a countryman tore at his heart he hankered after rural doings and the rough deep speech of the shires he did not pause to explain the cause of this sudden yearning to men who could hardly be expected to understand it he simply followed his own immediate inclination making a hasty and inadequate excuse he escaped into the street and setting off northward and alone he struck up across the fields the delicate scent of hay was wafted warmly round him every hedgerow was a blaze of blossom roses honeysuckle elder every brook was fringed with meadowsweet and loosestrife among these exquisitely calm surroundings what worth had the sordid and squalid manners of the stage with its petty ambitions its puny failures or successes the boisterous conviviality of the mermaid the dazzling interchange of thrust and parry his own reputation as a fellow of infinite jest and a nobly endowed poet all sank away into nothing as the midsummer twilight a glimmering grey translucence slowly replaced the splendours of the day o oh, jupiter how weary are my spirits sighed shakespeare like his own rosalind as flinging himself beneath the broad and leafy boughs he became submerged in the infinite maternal peace of nature shortly as darkness deepened he would return to his lonely room in silver street challenged by the watch and replying in some gay jest shortly he would toss upon a sleepless bed consumed by violent and varied emotions until the cooler wind that comes with dawn should soothe him into rest but now he lay like the three wanderers in arden against the bole of a huge oak watching the glow-worms gleaming round and the stars stealing forth above him until the floor of heaven was all o'erlaid with patines of bright gold and the day by that celestial sign was ended end of section nine